Good evening, everybody. Uh, it's 5.30 and we're going to go ahead and get started with our um, community meeting here. Uh, good evening. My name is Ian Larkin. Uh, I'm the unit chief for CAL FIRE here in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. Uh, and I would like to welcome you all to the first of two CAL FIRE uh, CZU Lightning Complex community meetings that are being held. Uh, tonight's uh, meeting will be for Supervisorial District 3, uh, focusing on the Bonnie Dune, Davenport, and North Coast uh, areas. Uh, and the second meeting will be held tomorrow night for Supervisorial District 5, uh, focusing on the San Lorenzo Valley, uh, incorporating the communities of Felton, Ben Lomond, Brookdale, Boulder Creek, Ziani, and Scotts Valley. Um, if you are from another area of the county, I uh, just want to let you know this same information will be provided uh, at each of the meetings. Uh, I would like to start uh, by taking a moment uh, of silence in recognition of Mr. Tad Jones, uh, who tragically lost his life during the CZU Lightning Complex fire. All right, thank you for that moment of silence. Uh, I would like to uh, first apologize uh, to you all for how long it's taken CAL FIRE to hold these community meetings. Uh, normally we would hold these meetings um, uh, for the community um, in person and prior to the control of the incident uh, to allow our CAL FIRE incident management, management team uh, to participate uh, in this important meeting. Uh, but that, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were unable to meet those goals. Um, we came to a realization uh, that we had come to the point that we can no longer wait any longer to hold these meetings. Um, so uh, we are here tonight to provide this, um, this meeting. The meeting will be uh, to provide you all a incident summary of the incident, uh, as well as some lessons learned. Uh, this is not meant to be a after action review. Uh, our presentation uh, is approximately 50 minutes, five zero minutes in length, uh, and we'll conclude um, at the conclusion of the presentation, we will have an answer and question period. Um, we're all asking everybody to hold any questions you may have until the end of the presentation. <clears throat> I know these are challenging times for us all, and I know you have lost, uh, all, all of you that have lost homes, your emotions are high, um, and this is a very uh, difficult time for us all. Uh, I would like to say uh, we sympathize with you uh, for your losses, um, and we too um, have several firefighters that who uh, have suffered the same losses as you uh, with the loss of your homes. Um, I'm requesting that everybody be courteous uh, uh, as we uh, move through this uh, presentation and during our questions and answers so we can um, get as many questions answered as possible. I do want to remind everybody that this is a live meeting broadcast via community TV. With that, uh, I would like to introduce, introduce our panelists for tonight. Uh, tonight with me, I have CAL FIRE Deputy Chief Nate Armstrong, who will be co-presenting. I also have CAL FIRE Deputy Chief Jonathan Cox, who will be helped uh, to facilitate the question and answer session. From the Sheriff's Department, I have Sheriff Jim Hart. And from the Santa Cruz County Office of Emergency Services, I have Michael Beaton. Uh, Supervisor Coonerty is listening into the presentation, uh, but, but will not participate as a panelist. I would also like to thank Community TV uh, for this venue to deliver um, uh, this meeting to you, the public. And with that, we'll go ahead and get started with our presentation. Okay, get this slide to move. Okay, all right. Uh, I would like to start with just painting a, a, a quick overall picture uh, for you all uh, of the event. Um, at approximately 3 a.m. on August 16th, 2020, a lightning storm made landfall and generated approximately 12,000 plus lightning strikes across California. Uh, this uh, caused more than eight, or, I'm sorry, caused more than 585 fires across the state. And of those uh, fires, 24 of those fires became major incidents. Uh, 300 plus lightning strikes hit San Mateo and Santa Cruz County, causing 27 confirmed fires between the two counties. Uh, CZU uh, on a daily uh, basis staffs uh, 13 fire engines, two bulldozers, three fire crews, and we have four shift battalion chiefs uh, that act uh, as overhead for us uh, in our operational capacity uh, to cover approximately 455,000 acres of state responsibility area between the two counties. 
So leading up to this event, um, we have been experiencing um, significant drought conditions over the last several years, uh, as well as our recent weather uh, had, been, had been producing uh, very high temperatures in excess of 100 uh, degrees, as well as um, low humidities um, through um, uh, as low as 4% uh, over the, um, uh, the weeks leading up to um, the fires. And then in addition to that, we had no coastal influence. Uh, there was no fog uh, that had come into the area uh, to help us with that uh, relative humidity recovery. <clears throat> Uh, before I turn the presentation over to Deputy Chief Armstrong, uh, I would like to take a, um, uh, uh, a quick moment to make it clear to everybody that the decision and actions that we take uh, are based on three main priorities. And these priorities are in order. The protection of life, property, and the environment. Those are how we base our decisions. The last thing I want for anyone um, in, in this incident was for anybody to die or for anybody to lose their home. That was the absolute last thing that we wanted to occur. So I just wanna make that very clear to everybody. With that, I will turn it over to Chief Armstrong. Thank you, Chief, and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, as Chief Larkin said, my name is Nate Armstrong. I'm a Deputy Chief for CAL FIRE here in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. I oversee the uh, state operations uh, as well as uh, overall operations within Santa Cruz County. And uh, I'll be talking with you folks for a little bit about uh, our operations and um, basically what occurred in the first couple of days of uh, these fires. So uh, starting out, uh, actually starts out on Saturday, August 15th. Uh, we knew this weather was coming. Uh, we just didn't know exactly how bad it was gonna be. Uh, what you should be seeing on your screen, and I'm not gonna go into great detail of what the lightning plan is, but we do have a pre-designated plan. Uh, we call it an LCA or Lightning Coordination Area Plan uh, that we use, for instance, just as this. And it's a way for us to uh, divide out uh, geographical areas um, and be able to go search out uh, every single lightning strike and see if a fire has occurred and so forth. So uh, like I say, on the 15th, we knew the weather was coming. Uh, our duty chief uh, just reiterated this plan to the whole unit, told everybody to get their eyes on it, uh, you know, one more time and be fresh with it because it was likely going to be utilized. Uh, the plan was absolutely utilized. It was utilized to a T. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we could never really get to full implementation because we were so limited on resources, uh, which you're going to hear uh, several times throughout this, I'm sure. Uh, so that, that's it on the uh, lightning plan. I just want to touch on it really briefly. Um, and go into what we saw uh, when we woke up on Sunday morning, August 16th. So uh, as Chief indicated, uh, that morning of the 16th, we ended up with 27 known fires in the unit. And like he said, we only have 13 uh, CAL FIRE engines within San Mateo and Santa Cruz. Unit. So you can see where that was uh, kind of taxing. And uh, as you can see there, we got hundreds of 911 calls. Uh, for every, you know, little plume of smoke uh, that, that you might see, we get dozens of 911 calls. So you can imagine with uh, how visible some of these were and everything, um, as uh, more people woke up that morning, uh, we just got more and more uh, inundation of those calls. So our system was totally strained. Uh, very early in the morning, about six o'clock, we uh, held all of our personnel on duty, uh, meaning nobody could go off. And uh, that would remain in force for well over a month. Uh, that our folks just weren't going home. Uh, so it was a couple of months before some people had a single day off. Also that day, we uh, called out all of our volunteer companies uh, within Santa Cruz County Fire. There's uh, five volunteer companies throughout, uh, throughout the county that uh, uh, CAL FIRE manages. And uh, we called all those companies to staff any equipment that they had available. Uh, we also staffed every additional uh, reserve and uh, county funded uh, piece of apparatus at our disposal uh, to the point that we were pretty much out of engines uh, to put folks on and we had folks in pickup trucks with hand tools and pumps uh, just going out to be able to uh, make first access to these fires and assess what we truly had. Next slide there chief. So what I want to show you folks with this map is uh, basically the 24 fires that most people never knew existed. 
So uh, you won't see the uh, couple of major fires, or sorry, the couple of fires on here that uh, grew to be the large CZU August complex, or yeah, sorry, August lightning complex that many of you know. Uh, you can see the naming of those fires, some of, you know, 5-3, uh, et cetera. The, that's all within that um, LCA uh, plan. And that's just a way for us to track those fires. So like I say, most of the uh, fires that those 27 fires were extinguished or kept very small uh, on that first day. Uh, a couple of fires to note here uh, is the 3-11. That 3-11 was in the Ziani area. It was a fairly well populated area, a um, lot of homes. Uh, that fire was a little better than 10 acres and we were able to uh, contain that fire without any loss of life or property. The 3-10 was up in the China grade area. You may see that. And that again was a pretty much immediate threat to uh, uh, property that, that we had no loss uh, because that was extinguished that first day. So. Uh, the unfortunate thing about having this number of fires, we can't just put them out and walk away. So they still continue to have a bit of a resource drain, uh, even as we extinguish them that first day or within the first 24 hours. Uh, one fire that I actually don't have on this map that probably should be uh, was the Waranella fire. You'll see it in a couple of other places. I say that it probably should be on here because we contain that fire in about the first 24 hours. Uh, and like I said, we, we just had in a patrol status. Um, so uh, of the 27 fires, uh, 24 of them were extinguished within the first 24 hours. Uh, one other thing I wanna touch on while we're here, since you see all those different fire names and stuff, um, is the name of this fire. We've, we've heard a lot of questions. Why is it called the CZU Lightning Complex? And so I uh, just wanna break it down really quick before we move on. Um, there's 21 operational units uh, of CAL FIRE throughout the state. Uh, here in Santa Cruz County is part of the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit. Uh, and all of those units have a three letter identifier. So ours here is CZU. Please don't ask why, I don't understand why, it just is. Um, so when we have a large fire or many fires rather uh, managed under one structure, such as we had here with 27 plus or 20, around 27 fires, it's called a complex. And so we needed one name. And so that's why you see the CZU August Lightning Complex. So hopefully I didn't spend too much time on that. I just want to answer the question because I know it continually comes up. Uh, Chief, if you can move to the next slide, please. So uh, this photo is uh, from San Mateo County looking south down Highway 1. It's looking at the Waddell fire. Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with the Waddell fire, it was in the Waddell Creek uh, drainage uh, near Rancho Del Oso, near the, the county line for Santa Cruz County and, and San Mateo County on the North Santa Cruz County uh, coast. Um, this fire was actually the closest, you'll see it on a map in a little while. This was the closest fire um, to the last chance community. And while it wasn't an immediate threat, it was definitely the highest probability of a threat uh, to the last chance community. Now we did have folks uh, on that fire continuously from the 16th uh, on, and that fire was actually pretty uh, close to being contained on the 18th uh, when the other fires blew up and we had to uh, pull the resources off of the Waddell fire to go help fire, fire, uh, fire in the last chance community. Uh, next slide there, Chief. So on uh, Monday the 17th, like I said, we had extinguished or, or contained most of the fires the day before. On Monday the 17th, we were really dealing with five large fires. Um, and I'll show them all to you in a second. Uh, one of those was the Waranella, which I previously mentioned. That was uh, basically just north of the community of Davenport, the, basically the largest threat at that time to uh, the communities of Davenport and Bonnie Doon. Uh, and then you had the Waddell that I was just showing you. And then there were three other fires. You're looking at two of them in the graphic there uh, that were pretty deep in uninhabited, inaccessible areas of uh, Redwood Forest in, in Southern San Mateo County. So of these five large fires, we put 80 plus acres each because 80 was about the smallest. 
uh, that Warinello is about 120. Each of these ones was a little over 100. I uh, forget the total for that day. We'll have it another graphic, but uh, essentially on the 17th, we were looking at a total of about 800 acres. Um, those were all in heavy timber areas uh, with very slow uh, rates of spread. And by rates of spread, uh, I mean, it was just, they were backing down in uh, kind of timber understories, um, not burning the treetops or anything, ju just backing and should have been easily controlled if we could eventually get the resources needed. Now on this map here, this was actually um, one of our field supervisors, a, a branch director, uh, his working map for the incident. And you can see that pink outline that follows kind of some roads and some topographic features. That was his plan, his containment plan to capture those two fires. Uh, the, just the critical thing for that is you need the resources to do it, which uh, we were incredibly limited on and we continued to place uh, large resource requests. They just uh, weren't necessarily available. Next slide, Chief. So here's an aerial shot uh, of, uh, from Monday, August 17th. Like I was just saying, it was an understory burn. And what we mean by that is that's all that ground litter, all that uh, dead material that's been falling out of trees for dozens, uh, bordering on 100 years. Uh, because a lot of this area, we don't have recorded fire history, meaning uh, we don't have any record of any wildfires burning in those areas. So we know that there was a lot of dead uh, fuel on the ground. However, um, like you see the next note, there is no crowning. And what we mean by crowning is uh, when the fire starts burning in the treetops. So once it starts getting in the treetops, that's like the fire activity that many folks saw late night of the 18th, early morning 19th, and still moving into the evening of the 19th. There is no controlling those crown fires. But what we had here on the 17th still was fairly manageable. The problem with the 17th was that some of the other fires in the Bay Area uh, exploded. They, they grew exponentially. Um, and those were in the Santa Clara and North Bay areas, particularly the fires in the North Bay uh, were in uh, well-populated areas with immediate threats to life. And so they, uh, unfortunately for us, got a majority of semi-available resources and it le left us kind of um, stranded for some resources still on the 17th. Uh, next slide, Chief. So on the 17th, we did get um, a couple of helicopters assigned to the fire. We were able to fly the fire and really finally get a good aerial reconnaissance of, of what exactly we had. Um, that day we requested a, a type three incident management team. That's the South Bay incident management team that's made up of local um, cooperators. It's a multi-agency uh, response. And what that did for us was uh, just allow us to uh, assist us in establishing some of the logistical functions, some of the long-term planning, some of the tracking of resources as, as this incident would continue to grow. Um, we did continue to request additional resources. Um, between the 17th and 18th, we had outstanding uh, resource requests for over 150 fire engines that would go unfilled. That was what, that was the bare minimum that we knew we needed in addition to what we already had to control these fires, but we just wouldn't get it. Uh, also on this day, we began to, uh, we, we saw that it was gonna be a long-term uh, event. And so we started to uh, integrate with um, the county administrative um, folks for both San Mateo and Santa Cruz County, uh, began to uh, have dialogue with the sheriff's offices and with local OESs. But still on this day, at least in the morning and up to midday, that fire was still moving at a very slow rate of spread. Next slide, Chief. So here is a map of five fires. Um, and you can see, all, hopefully you can see all the way down there at the bottom, the Waranella fire, which I previously mentioned. Um, we contain that to about 120 acres. And like I said, that was off Waranella Road, uh, just north of the community of, of Davenport and uh, Bonnie Dune. You can see that Waddell fire on the coast. Those three other little blobs that you see, the 5-14, 5-15, and 5-18, uh, those 
uh, and you can see that yellow line uh, is the county line. Th those three fires are the ones that would grow together to be the large fire that everybody knows. And on the 17th, those were still fairly small and sitting uh, fairly well within uh, San Mateo County, not near any populated areas of uh, Santa Cruz County just yet. Uh, next slide, Chief. So here's a slightly different map of those same fires. Uh, and just a couple of things on, on here. So you can see um, 861 uh, total acres at that point on the 17th. And you can also see, uh, at least for those two fires in the furthest north, this is a, a topographic relief map. So you, see, you can kind of see some uh, land features like mountains. Those two fires sitting in the north were sitting on the lee side of um, of that ridge top, and they were just slowly burning downhill. Like I said, slowly burning that understory away. Um, I do want you guys to imprint this map if you if you can, though, because we're going to show you this same map a couple other times throughout this presentation, um, and, and it'll kind of show you the progression of the fire as a whole. Uh, next slide, Chief. So this is a photo uh, late day in the 17th. I think this was probably about one of the last flights the helicopter was able to make that day. And we see a couple of things from this. From the smoke, we see that it's still that, that easy kind of gradual understory burn. Uh, but the one thing that we do see in this is uh, the winds are starting to pick up. They're starting to lay down uh, that smoke, really bend it over, that does a few things for us. It makes uh, fighting uh, fire with aircraft difficult when they can't see and can't get in. But it also is a, a sign of what was to come with some of the uh, weather. And you'll see in future um, slides as the fire picked up in intensity, you'll see that smoke change quite a bit. So uh, with that, uh, Chief, I think we'll turn it back to you. OK, uh, thank you, Chief Armstrong. Um, so this kind of brings us uh, to the next day on the 18th. Uh, on the 18th, the three largest fires that Chief Armstrong was talking about that you saw up in the, the San Mateo County area uh, continued to burn towards the south. Uh, those fires were mostly burning in the understory uh, in the, in the, under the canopy. Uh, but as uh, things started to progress that day, those fires started to burn with greater intensity. Uh, and that total acreage growth uh, was starting to cause some concerns. Um, as Chief Armstrong had mentioned that uh, we had already requested uh, a type three incident management team uh, to come in and assist us with uh, logistical and planning needs. Um, so at this point, uh, when we, we saw started to see this increase, um, we went ahead and made a request uh, to Cal Fire for a type one incident management team to come in and assist uh, the type three uh, and build that larger organization to uh, meet the complexity that we felt could be coming in the, in the near future. Um, one thing I, I do wanna point out is the uh, CAL FIRE has six incident management teams statewide, uh, and we already had multiple teams deployed, uh, and we weren't really confident at the level of uh, deployment we were going to get from the team. Uh, and uh, to our surprise, when the team uh, arrived, it came with 90, 95% of its uh, uh, total strength. So that was a great uh, asset and a, a help to us uh, when that team did arrive. Um, as uh, the, the day progressed on the 18th, uh, that fire, as I said, that fire activity started to increase. Um, crews out in the field started reporting that they were starting to see spot fires um, uh, outside of their, um, uh, of the main fire perimeter uh, that was there, uh, which was a cause for concern. Um, these fires had still uh, been burning primarily in the uh, understory. Uh, we had maybe the isolated tree that would torch, but nothing in the crowns. Uh, that was causing uh, any concern for a significant crown run. Um, as uh, the, the 18th continued on, um, uh, our map that showed that morning, and this was a map you saw earlier, um, that growth uh, that we saw from the 17th to the 18th was approximately 4,709 acres. Um, it was really difficult to be able to see uh, under the smoke to actually see the, uh, uh, the actual fire line. Um, but these were the best estimations that we could get from aerial aircraft, resources on the ground uh, that were reporting back to us the, uh, the location and the intensity that this fire was burning. So for, for the 18th, our total acreage at that time was about 5,500 acres. Uh, the Warnella fire uh, had little uh, to no growth 
uh, on the between the 17th and 18th. And at that point, the Waddell fire had resources committed to it. Uh, and one thing to point out about the Waddell fire um, is the accessibility, even though it sat right on Highway 1, was very difficult. There's no roads into there. Uh, there's only a few uh, small trails to be able to access uh, that area. Uh, and uh, with that, we, um, we were having to actually use dozers to uh, build containment line uh, into that fire. <clears throat> so um, as the day progressed on the 18th, the fire continued to push south, as I, as I said. Um, at this point, um, we entered into unified command with uh, uh, the sheriff's department from both counties, uh, just as a, a precursor to potential events of uh, having to do evacuations uh, and that sort. So we wanted to make sure that uh, we had that uh, relationship established and that uh, we were ready to pull the trigger if we needed to. So this is just to give you a little bit of perspective of what uh, the visual of the fire was. This is a picture from uh, Cloverdale Road looking south at about 3.20 in the afternoon. As you can see, they're starting to get a, a pretty good buildup. Uh, fire intensity was uh, uh, increasing uh, and starting to, to build. This next picture is just another depiction looking south from um, uh, Pillar Point Harbor in uh, Half Moon Bay. Uh, picture really gives us a depiction of how uh, fast the intensity was growing. Uh, this was just uh, later in the afternoon, just before uh, dusk when the sun was really starting to go down. Um, so it shows you how the intensity of that fire at night uh, was actually uh, burning actually better at night than it was during the day. Um, uh, as we progressed into uh, that, that evening, um, uh, evacuation orders had been initiated uh, in Boulder Creek and Bonnie Dune uh, and the North Coast. Um, as you can see this picture from Highway 236 uh, looking uh, back towards the north, you can see that fire coming down uh, out of um, that area burning down towards Big Basin. Uh, and then the picture on the right is just another picture from Pillow Point Harbor um, that uh, kind of depicts what was happening in that rapid increase of fire activity. Uh, I do want to point out, um, you know, we had resources assigned uh, to this fire from the very beginning. We had folks that had worked uh, double shift. They'd been out there since three o'clock, um, uh, August 16th, and that Sunday morning uh, from the very beginning, had worked all the way through um, uh, Sunday into Monday and into, into Tuesday morning on the 18th. Uh, so we had double and triple shifted a lot of resources and due to fatigue uh, we needed and for our, fire, for our firefighter safety, we needed to get these guys a little bit of rest. So uh, we had had some of these folks uh, be able to go bed down uh, to get some rest until we could get additional resources. Um, we ended up having to wake those folks out of bed uh, uh, mid evening to put them back out on the fire line to deal with the increased fire behavior that we uh, saw that um, had a drastic um, uh, change in the uh, uh, progression of the fire um, throughout that uh, rest of that evening on the 18th going into the 19th. I'm going to show you just a, a quick little video. Um, this is a uh, uh, some of those resources that were uh, woken up out of bed were sent into Big Basin State Park to assist state parks in evacuating the park uh, when the fire had come down to. Um, when, as this video rolls through, I just want to give you a depiction of it. Uh, the fire resources that were in there affecting those uh, rescues and attempting to uh, protect what structures they could in Big Basin actually got their uh, escape route cut off and were trapped in here for uh, a significant period of time before they could exit uh, safely. Oh. So that kind of just gives you a realization of what those guys uh, uh, were dealing with uh, inside Big Basin State Park as that fire uh, moved, uh, continued to move down out of the park uh, towards uh, Bonnie Dune, Boulder Creek, and uh, the Last Chance area. Um, this is just a, a picture of some of those resources that were pull, pulled off the Warnella fire to go up into Last Chance uh, to help uh, protect uh, some of those uh, residents up there. And this was, picture was taken around 2 a.m. Uh, in the last chance community on the morning, early morning of the 19th. 
So early uh, on the morning of the 19th, um, our CAL FIRE incident management team, uh, they had arrived on uh, late afternoon on the 18th. Uh, they were out doing some engagement with our operational folks, getting the lay of the land, uh, uh, kind of figuring out how the organizational structure had been set up. And at 0800 uh, on the 19th, our incident command team uh, actually took command of the fire uh, post briefing. Um, that day, uh, we were getting reports of spot fires uh, in advance of six miles ahead of the main fire. Um, that day, the fire had consumed more than 43,000 acres between uh, the morning of the 18th and the uh, morning of the 19th. A significant uh, fire um, progression that occurred um, in that 24 hour period. Uh, nothing that, that we've ever seen uh, in Santa Cruz or San Mateo County uh, in uh, the 100 years of recorded fire history that we have. Um, slide here. Um, I just wanted to show a camera. Uh, this is a camera view of a alert wildfire camera uh, that is uh, located up in the Bonnie Dune area up off of Patrick Drive. Um, and I just want to note this was a, a good depiction of what occurred and when it occurred. So this was on the 19th at about 11 uh, 22 uh, in the at night. Um, and that was uh, severe fire activity that was occurring in and around that area. So this is just a, a, a picture of that map with that, uh, that fire growth that we had um, from the 18th to the 19th. As you can see, it grew 43,566 acres in that 24 hour period. <clears throat> This is just a, a, a visual of that uh, fire growth that occurred. Um, uh, this was taken the morning of the 20th. Um, and uh, you can see that fire was still progressing uh, to the south, moving through the uh, area of Bonnie Dune and uh, Swanton area. So uh, by this point, um, uh, numerous evacuation uh, orders were in effect in both uh, San Mateo and Santa Cruz County. Uh, and between the uh, the 18th and the 22nd, um, uh, there was over 77,000 uh, residents that were um, ordered to evacuate. Um, that was a monumental task uh, for the Sheriff's Department uh, to undertake in the, uh, both counties and uh, um, to, to only walk away with only one fatality based on how fast this fire uh, progressed um, is a, is a, a testament to the sheriff's hard work in, uh, in getting people notified. Um, the next photo is um, a couple of progression photos that we'll show you here. Um, this was the um, basically the morning of the 20th. Um, we started to see a little bit slowing of the progression. Uh, we only had 15,000 acres that day. Um, on the 21st, um, you'll see that our progression was only 11,000 acres. Um, and then on the 22nd, you can see our progression had been reduced um, significantly uh, to the point of about 4,178 acres. And that sounds like um, a small amount in comparison, but that was still a pretty significant growth. But one of the key elements was uh, in that slowing of the progression was we were actually starting to get resources coming in, which will be uh, talked about just here briefly uh, by Chief Armstrong. Um, I wanted to show this. This is a progression map um, that we had. It's, uh, it's automated, so it's going to basically start from uh, when the first lightning strikes and then run through uh, almost to the end of the fire. So it'll be a, just a brief second here or so. As you see the red dots, those are the areas where the lightning strikes occurred. And then you'll see uh, as the fires grow uh, over the days, the progression map will come up underneath it. So as you can see, uh, those last few uh, days of it from the 26th to the 28th uh, pretty much had no to a little to no progression at all. Um, 
I wanted to just uh, show you this uh, uh, progression map as well. This is um, uh, uh, from our um, evacuation man management platform uh, that we use Zone Haven uh, for during the fires. Um, this will kind of give you a depiction of uh, when the evacuations occurred, but also it will show the fire progression underneath the uh, evacuation notices. So the different colors you're seeing here, the red is obviously the evacuated areas, the yellow is warnings, and the green is actually when we did the repopulation uh, towards, uh, you know, once it was safe to allow folks to go back into those areas, uh, both uh, infrastructure was replaced uh, and the community uh, area was made safe for the public to re-enter. Um, it took some time to get that repopulation done uh, in coordination with uh, all of our uh, uh, counterparts in PG&E and, &E and uh, all of our uh, communications folks to get all that infrastructure back in place for the community. So as you can see, it uh, took a little bit while. Here we are all the way to the 19th, the 20th of September, um, and we still had folks that were out of their homes. Um, even, even past the 22nd, we still had folks that were out uh, of the homes, but uh, eventually we got everybody back in uh, to their homes. And currently there's only one zone that is currently uh, uh, still in a mandatory evacuation. And then that is the zone that encompasses uh, Big Basin State Park. At this point, I will turn it back over to Chief Arnold. All right, uh, thank you, Chief. I uh, just wanted to spend the next couple of minutes talking about uh, resource, the resources that we had uh, assigned uh, to this fire or lack thereof. And uh, the one thing I want to say right off the, the bat is, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of that we didn't have enough resources on this fire. And we do not disagree with that one bit. We absolutely agree. Um, Chief Larkin and I will stand right there with you and say that we did not have enough resources on this fire. I already told you about the outstanding orders for over 150 fire engines. That was the bare minimum that we wanted because we knew that there was other things going on. We just weren't getting the, the folks that we needed. Um, so we agree with you. We aren't, we aren't here to tell you that, no, we had plenty of resources. Um, a couple of other things um, that uh, some folks might not realize, and I won't play a guessing game or anything. I'll just tell you uh, straight out. Cal Fire staffs 356 fire engines statewide at its peak of summer, which we were in at this time. Uh, but that's 356 fire engines for the entire state. With the amount of fires going on and everything, we, we can't have all 356 of those fire engines. So we rely on other sources through mutual aid and so forth. So uh, we have heard, you know, it, that it was folks say it was, you know, a week before they saw a Cal Fire engine and, and so forth. And that might be true. Because uh, they might not just been on on uh, your area of the fire, but the, all of those um, resources that were on the fire were, were ordered through our structure. A uh, couple of things on this graph um, to to note: um, number one, uh, so so you have acreage, the containment, and the total number of folks assigned per day. Um, you notice in that med that uh, middle column on containment that. Um, we didn't get any containment until uh, at least, uh, you know, not official on the map, uh, until it hit 5% on the 22nd, nearly a week in. Um, that was because uh, Chief Larkin previously told you, told you all, we have three priorities on every single incident. Those priorities never change. They're the same on the smallest fire to the largest fire. It's life safety first, before property and before environment. When there's folks in the area of the fire, we can't get out of that life safety mode. So we were one, short on resources, but two, as long as we had folks in the area of the fire that we had to account for, made things very difficult to protect homes. Hard as we would try and everything, we, have to, we had to work around those folks and get them out of the area. So it just made things uh, a little difficult. 
Um, another thing to note here is all the, the we have the total personnel assigned column there. Um, that's all the people assigned to the fire. So there's some there's some numbers in there that um, those are the support folks. Those are the, the the mechanics, the people in in camp. You know, keeping this fire. Uh, uh, moving forward and so forth. So those, are, those aren't necessarily all line personnel. We were we were totally strapped for people actually on the fire. Um, I mentioned uh, mutual aid. So we had, like I said, we had put out um, for all of our volunteer companies to staff uh, whatever equipment they could. Uh, we did have uh, engagement from all five of our uh, volunteer companies. We pretty much completely taxed uh, Santa Cruz County's uh, local government agencies, our, our, our city and fire district cooperators, uh, to the point that uh, evening on the 18th, when this thing was burning out of control and we were taking everything that we could, I was getting calls from, because we had cities that we had taken all of their fire engines and we had to get something back to uh, take care of the, the you know, medical aids that still happened in those cities. Um, I, I mentioned the need for mutual aid from all over California. Uh, with Cal Fire only having 356 fire engines, we have to get uh, fire engines from other municipalities and other agencies. And that all takes a little bit of time. That's unfortunate, we know. We want it here right now. Um, we wanted firefighters by the thousands and they were trickling in by the tens or sometimes if we were lucky by the hundreds over the course of a day. Um, it just takes a day or two for that uh, reflex sometimes. Uh, by the end of this uh, incident, I know it, we didn't have them when we needed them, but by the end of the incident, we had um, resources from the National Guard. We had resources from uh, all over the US from as far as New Jersey. Uh, so like I say, we, you can't get firefighters from New Jersey to a fire in Santa Cruz in, in a day. It just takes some time, unfortunately. Um, I think that's it on that, Chief, if you can move to the next slide. So one thing I wanna talk about is the, the resource allocation and kind of what we're in competition with. So here's a snapshot of all the fires. This is on, on August 23rd, and it's just because it was the only uh, graphic of this that we could find. But if you look at um, the start date on a lot of those fires listed, they were all about the same time as ours. They were, you know, uh, um, August 16th, 17th or before. So these are all those fires that are out there. And what happens at the statewide level and uh, trickling up to the uh, national level is there's a daily coordination call that happens where um, all these uh, sizable fires have sent in um, our resource summaries. And there's a, a number of factors in there from uh, the size to the threat, uh, potential, you know, number of uh, structures threatened and, and so forth. And there's a very defined ranking, uh, basically grading uh, process that those go through to determine which fires are gonna get uh, or, or the higher, highest priorities. So uh, you, you see all these uh, fires going throughout the state. One of those fires uh, ended up being a million acres um, by, the, by the time it was done. It was burned at the same time as ours, first million acre fire in California history. So uh, we, we were in steep, steep competition for uh, resources. Uh, I do want to, um, Chief, if you can go to the next slide. So from the first three days of the fire, uh, based on that grading criteria, we were uh, the third priority in the state for resources. Um, it wasn't until the fire blew up that we became the number one priority. But I did wanna share with you folks uh, just, just this graphic and I'll explain kind of what it is. Uh, this is our fire, the CZU August Lightning Fire in that top row. Uh, below it is the Santa Clara uh, Lightning Complex that was burning just the east of us in Santa Clara County. Uh, the row below that is the LNU Lightning Complex. That was in uh, CAL FIRE's Sonoma Lake Napa unit uh, in the North Bay area. Uh, mainly, I believe, in Sonoma County that fire was going. And then we had the River Fire, which was in Monterey, just to the south of us. And this is just a daily resource count. And so, um, like I already told you all, we agree. We did not have the resources that we needed, that we wanted to, to truly control these and never get to the point where we got. But on that day, on the 16th, the first day, we were guesstimating uh, about 300 acres, what we had. We had a bulldozer, 20 engines, four crews, and a couple of water tenders. Uh, if you go down to um, that river fire in Monterey that day, they were, uh, they had 
almost seven times the acreage that we did, but we still happen managed to get five more fire engines than them, same number of crews, and that was happening in a populated area as well. Uh, if you go forward to uh, the 17th, we were sitting at 861 acres. Uh, we had 20 fire engines that day, two fire crews, uh, two helicopters, and three water tenders. Uh, Santa Clara, just to the east of us, their fire was nearly four times the size, and we had four times the number of fire engines. Uh, we had a couple of helicopters. They had none. They have a helicopter in their unit, and they couldn't even have it because um, it was being utilized elsewhere. Uh, fast forward past the 18th, we, um, that was the day that everything blew up. And if you look down that column for the 19th, uh, our fire isn't the only one that blew up that day. That was a significant uh, pattern that came through and, and everybody's fires increased exponentially. So while we went to nearly 50,000 acres, uh, that fire next door in Santa Clara went to 102,000 acres. Uh, we still managed to get three times the number of bulldozers than them, uh, twice the number of fire engines, a couple more hand crews and a, a lot more helicopters. Uh, looking down at that fire in uh, Sonoma Lake, Napa, at 124,000 acres, they hadn't even begun to report on that fire until that day uh, because it was, they were managing it locally. They have a much larger unit than us uh, and it grew so exponentially that then they started reporting. But if you look, uh, their fire was, was 75,000 acres more than ours. We had more, more bulldozers, same number of engines. We had twice as many crews. So like I say, we did not have what we needed to. Absolutely agree 100%. Um, in the grand scheme of things, sitting in that priority list, uh, it's amazing that we were getting what, what we got. And uh, with that, that's really all that I have on the resource allocation. Uh, and I'll send it back to you, Chief. Okay, uh, thanks, Chief Armstrong. Um, so uh, kind of getting ready here to wrap up a little bit. So just to kind of summarize um, uh, some of the events, uh, uh, during during this incident, um, you know, information was uh, very uh, important to make sure that we got that out. Uh, during this incident, we sent out 112 informational releases uh, uh, throughout the incident. Uh, we were holding uh, 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. news briefings. Um, you know, we were trying to get as much information out to the public as we possibly could. Uh, in the early days, um, we just did not have the resources uh, to allocate to that type of uh, uh, media blitz. Uh, and plus, the fires uh, were were relatively small in nature, um, but uh, as that grew and the team got here, we were able to put that information together. Um, we did have one civilian um, fatality in last chance, uh, which was an unfortunate uh, circumstance of this fire. Um, we did evacuate 77,000 people. Um, and as we said from the very beginning, we have three priorities, life, property, and the environment. Uh, and due to our lack of resources, uh, number one priority was get people out of the way of this fire as it progressed. Uh, and I think uh, the evacuation of those 77,000 people um, was uh, our number one priority uh, uh, of this incident uh, was to get people out of harm's way. Uh, our final acreage for this fire was uh, 86,509 acres. Um, 63,754 of those acres were in Santa Cruz County uh, and 22,755 of those uh, were in San Mateo County. Um, uh, we unfortunately had 1,490 structures destroyed in this fire. Uh, 1,431 of those in Santa Cruz County, and of that, 911 of those were single-family uh, residences. Uh, at the peak of the incident, we had over 2,400 firefighters. Um, that was a peak. It didn't last very long because um, as we started to gain containment, other fires were breaking out in the state, as you saw in the, uh, uh, the graph that um, uh, Chief Armstrong uh, showed, um, and we were having to actually release resources uh, uh, as we started to gain containment and we could make things available to go elsewhere uh, in the state. Um, but we were confident and the team was confident uh, that we had adequate resources to keep the fire uh, from growing uh, any larger than it had already grown. Um, this was the largest uh, fire in Santa Cruz history. Um, as I had mentioned early in the uh, incident that this, uh, this was a historic event. Uh, and uh, I hope we never have to uh, have another fire uh, any bigger than what we've already had. Uh, during this fire, um, we had uh, a lot of our infrastructure was uh, destroyed. Uh, we had multiple bridges in the county that was destroyed. I know several bridges out on Swanton were um, impacted, as well as you had the utilities 
and everything else, including uh, uh, drinking water, potable water uh, out on the coast that were destroyed uh, in these fires. Uh, and that infrastructure is still uh, being worked on to get it fully back operational. Um, we remained on this incident for months um, uh, and we continue to, to go out uh, when we do have uh, problem areas. Um, to this day, we still, uh, in January, when we had uh, the wind event that came through, uh, we did have a, a few uh, spots that uh, flared back up that uh, were well in the interior of the fire, uh, but uh, that's just the type of fuels that we have. We have these heavy fuels that can continue to uh, burn for long periods of time. And obviously, uh, we haven't gotten a substantial amount of rain, uh, which uh, could be problematic uh, moving into the next fire season. Uh, the cost of this fire is over $68 million um, uh, over the, uh, the period of this fire. And uh, one of the big things is uh, uh, that I want to preface is, um, you know, we exhausted every available resource uh, that we had available to us. Um, I am the uh, uh, state OES operational area coordinator for Santa Cruz County. Um, and during this uh, period of time, uh, we were reaching out to our neighbors, uh, uh, to each of the counties next to us. Uh, and asking them if there was any way they could provide us any additional resources. And several of them were able to provide us uh, a specific number of resources for a limited period of time. Um, and uh, uh, we would utilize those resources uh, and then we would need to give them back as they had uh, needs for them as well in their county. So, um, you know, we, uh, we, we, we totally exhausted all those uh, assets that were available to us. Um, so uh, this was just an aerial photo that we had um, been able to take from a helicopter on a flight we had kind of showing the aftermath of what this fire did. Um, this was a heavily forested area, um, redwood, uh, conifer, a lot of different fuel types in there, uh, you know, pines uh, uh, and different uh, species uh, throughout that whole, whole entire area from, uh, you know, the Butano all the way down to uh, the lower end of Bonnie Dune. Um, so this was just a picture showing uh, what it looked like from an aerial footage of the uh, just devastation that uh, occurred from this fire. So getting into our lessons learned um, from this fire. So uh, one of the, the things that we um, uh, looked at very, very closely is our fuel conditions. Um, so our fuel conditions have never presented us uh, with this type of uh, fire condition uh, that we experienced during the CZU Lightning Complex. Um, you know, it's, it's been known that, you know, fires just don't grow to large sizes here uh, in our coastal uh, unit. Um, you know, in, in, in around the state, uh, San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties are, uh, were deemed the asbestos unit. You know, nothing burnt here because of the redwood forest and the moisture we had. Uh, well, um, that has changed drastically, and that's due to years of drought and climate change. Uh, and we're having to revisit um, what, how we look at those conditions of our fuels. And, uh, and, and how we uh, address those specific uh, fuel types uh, when we're making decisions on, on fires. Um, our uh, lightning, this lightning event, uh, it, it um, gave us an opportunity to evaluate our lightning coordination plan. Um, that plan was fully implemented uh, as it was designed, um, but due to the lack of resources, we weren't able to, unable to actually execute that as the plan was designed. So. Um, that is just due to the sheer lack of resources. Um, typically, uh, uh, in the history of this, uh, this unit, um, uh, any lightning events we've ever had, we've always been able to keep the fires very small, you know, three to five acres. Um, this time around, it was just a different circumstance with the total number of fires that we had uh, to deal with, uh, and then uh, the remoteness of uh, some of those fires. Um, evacuations. Um, uh, due to the increased uh, changes in our fuel conditions and how the rates of spreads uh, are changing in these fuel types, uh, uh, you know, that fire spread, uh, it, it just really changed uh, the mind, mindset of uh, how we look at evacuations. Evacuations are going to be need to be considered uh, much more in advance uh, and conducted much earlier uh, in an incident when we look at this uh, for future events that may occur um, so that we can uh, get folks out there uh, and get folks out of harm's way. Um, infrastructure failures. Um, with the damage that was caused by the lightning storm that came in here, we had several downdrafts that brought trees down. It took power lines, broken uh, power poles. pg e was in the midst of trying to get that infrastructure back in place in a lot of parts of the county. Um, but one of the things that uh, wasn't really realized uh, is the impacts uh, that had uh, prior to the fire. 
uh, you know, when the uh, phone lines and everything are impacted and the power is impacted, um, those phone lines uh, and that infrastructure are on backup, even the cable in some areas of the remote areas of the county that have it are on a backup battery system. And those systems fail over time. Um, and uh, not all those systems are being maintained at the level that they should be. Uh, and those batteries don't last as long as they probably should. Uh, and that hampered our ability to be able to get uh, information out to the public uh, via um, uh, different methods, either the internet, uh, social media, or uh, other platforms such as our uh, reverse 911 system. Um, and it leads into our uh, code red, our uh, county reverse 911 system. Um, that system is, uh, you know, it has a, it had a limited number of uh, residents that actually went on and actually registered for code red to receive those alerts. Um, so that hampered our ability to be able to help get information out um, to those folks. Um, so uh, this really pushes the issue where we physically have to have uh, folks go out to those residents and actually notify them uh, that the, they need to evacuate. Um, one of the other issues uh, that, that came up early in the uh, um, incident was uh, when we were conducting our reverse 911s, um, our uh, primary dispatch center, which is uh, NETCOM, uh, realized that the, the reverse 911 system had a throttling on it. Uh, they were able to work with the vendor uh, very quickly and get that throttling increase so that uh, we could meet demands. Uh, and one thing to take into consideration, um, uh, our infrastructure within the county, um, you know, as across the nation is, is old and, and is, is just deteriorating. Um, and you need to understand that uh, some of that infrastructure, the demands that we've put on it in different methods uh, can have an effect on how much information flow we can push through that, those lines that are out there uh, with all the data and everything that we're trying to do on a daily basis. Um, the California Mutual Aid, Fire Mutual Aid System. Um, you know, California has one of the most robust fire mutual aid systems. But in times like these, where you have 12,000 lightning strikes occur in the state, causing 585 fires and 20 of those becoming major events that you're staffing these fires um, with anywhere from, you know, 2,000 to 8,000 firefighters. Um, you know, as Chief Armstrong said, uh, this year we had a fire um, that it, it, it meant all time history in California, a million acres burned uh, in that fire. So it taxed our system uh, to, to, to its end. It, it really depleted that system beyond uh, its, uh, its uh, capabilities. Um, our evacuation platform that we utilize, uh, the County of Santa Cruz has an ma evacuation management platform. Um, it was developed after the Summit, Martin, Traving, and Lockheed fires in 2008, 2009. Uh, the version of that platform was used to initiate our evacuations uh, and transition to Zone Haven, which is our new evacuation management platform, uh, midstream in the fire with no um, uh, issues or uh, delay in uh, evacuations. But what the Zone Haven platform allowed us to do was to have a public facing side um, of, of a system that allows the residents and the community to be able to see what's going on uh, in real time as it's occurring. Um, uh, those, those platforms um, were, uh, that we used uh, provided uh, for the safe, su successful evacuation of 58,000 residents in Santa Cruz County and approximately 19,000 residents in San Mateo County. Um, moving into our fuel reduction efforts, uh, another lesson learned that we have here is, um, you know, we have not been able uh, to achieve our goals of fuel reduction. Fuel reduction is a difficult topic um, here in Santa Cruz County. Um, a lot's been done, uh, but there is a lot more work that needs to be done. Uh, and, and moving forward, this is going to be uh, a, a monumental task that's going to require a cooperative effort by all, uh, from the residents uh, to all of our community groups, fire safe councils, RCDs, uh, the county, uh, CAL FIRE. Uh, everybody involved is going to have to get in and really push this effort uh, to do better fuel reduction that is responsible. Um, our individual property owner defensible space inspections, LE100 inspections. Um, we have a lot of residents here in Santa Cruz County, and uh, I'll be the first one to say is our defensible space inspection program is probably not where it should be. Um, uh, we need to increase that, which we will be doing, um, <clears throat> but we really need to increase it with a greater emphasis on gathering uh, and gaining compliance from the property owner uh, in that process. Uh, it's easy to go out and do a couple inspections, gain some compliance, but we really need to have that defensible space uh, around these structures. <clears throat> so it makes it uh, uh, more defendable uh, when we have resources to defend them, but 
in, in the best sense of it, uh, defensible structure is something that can stand alone on its own and would not need to be protected uh, with additional resources. Um, our fire prevention uh, messaging um, is uh, another uh, area that we're looking to try to improve. Uh, you know, we send out constant messaging. We talk about it at the beginning of fire season, during fire season, uh, but we need to be uh, better at it. We need to get more involved with communities um, to, to have more uh, community meetings. Now with you know, the invent of uh, and the problems with COVID, you know, here we are, we're doing a virtual meeting that allows everybody to participate at a much greater level. So uh, we need to work at that and do better at that uh, fire prevention message. So uh, those were um, uh, some of our key lessons learned um, from the fire. Um, one of the, the elements that, um, that we will not be able to overcome is the sheer fact of the lack of resources that impacted our ability to um, make con set, uh, considerable suppression efforts <clears throat> to contain all of these fires. So that concludes our um, uh, program uh, for this portion of it, um, but we will get into an answer and question uh, section here in a minute. I'll be turning it over to Deputy Chief Jonathan Cox to help facilitate that. But before we do that, um, I just want to uh, make a couple statements here. Uh, I've provided here a, uh, a comments email. Um, it is czufirequestions at fire.ca.gov. Um, if we are not able to get to all of your questions tonight, either through the Q&A or the raise hand function, um, our Q&A uh, is being recorded for us. Um, we will be able to uh, gather that information and respond back uh, to those folks uh, and answer those questions. And this will also be posted to the community TV website uh, to be viewed. So uh, it's both being recorded uh, and the Q&A session will also be um, uh, available there to be able to uh, look back and see on questions uh, versus uh, we'll also be able to send an email to those that uh, um, ask the questions. Uh, in addition, we will be uh, submitting a follow-up survey via email for everybody to add additional information uh, and provide additional feedback uh, there'll be uh, information in there that is candid scripted questions about evacuations, uh, how you received them, things like that. But it'll also allow you uh, some areas to where you can actually free type uh, information, comments, or concerns. And lastly, um, uh, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, my name is Ian Lark and I'm the unit chief here. Uh, I've provided my office contact phone number. Uh, if for some reason your question is not answered um, and you have a, a desire to speak to me uh, directly, um, feel free to call that number. Um, if I don't answer, leave a voicemail and I will call you back. Uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, uh, Deputy Chief Jonathan Cox for our, to start our Q&A session. Thanks, Chief. Thank you, everybody. Uh, now we'll have time to answer questions and answers. Um, you'll be able to ask your question in a couple of different ways. One will be through the Zoom platform by raising your hand. Um, and due to the number of questions that we anticipate, we ask that you limit your question to just one when raising your hand and called upon. Um, we encourage you to use one of the secondary methods if you have additional questions, such as the survey link uh, or the actual email address itself. So first of all, uh, we'll um, call on people with the raise hand function. Um, if you are dialing in from a phone, you can hit star nine to raise your hand. Uh, if you're called upon, it will be star six to mute or unmute. The second option is to click on the question and answer button and write your question in the text box and submit. Uh, we'll answer those questions based on the number of votes. So you can vote a question up uh, if there is uh, kind of an overwhelming question that is really on everybody's mind. Um, we'll be alternating between the two, so we'll go between um, uh, call-in, raised hand questions, as well as the Q&A. Uh, again, if you're unable to get your question answered, um, you can email czufirequestions at fire.ca.gov or fill out the survey that will be emailed to you if, uh, at the address that you emailed in. Uh, just to note, this is an opportunity to ask questions and get answers. We really ask for professionalism um, and we will focus on the question. Uh, disruptions uh, are not gonna be um, uh, tolerated and we'll definitely get back to an email if that is an easier uh, way to communicate. Uh, the survey link will also be made available at the conclusion of the presentation 
um, with a link on the actual screen itself. Uh, and for those of you who we can't answer your questions tonight, uh, we will follow up with you and we're sorry that we can't do it. Uh, we are limited to two hours um, concluding at 7.30. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and start with um, the raised hand feature questions first. And we will start with Karen Dixon. And Karen, you should be able to speak by uh, unmuting. There you go. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, hi. Hey, um, I'm looking at photographs I took on the um, 16th and 17th of Adel Fire um, up on the hill. Teeny tiny. Um, and um, on the evening, Evening of the 16th, when I stopped to find out what the plan was, fire engines were all just sitting down at Waddell Creek or at um, Waddell. Um, uh, she told me to move on, but we, you know, I was able to talk to somebody who, uh, Janet Webb, who, who's the president of Big Creek Lumber, and she had told those, those, those folks down there that they could get up to that fire with a fire road. And and they not to. They did actually dump two loads, two helicopter loads of water on that before they took the helicopter away. Now, this is the fire, of course, that burned everyone's house on White House Canyon and everyone, and including my my mom and dad's house, my daughter's house, my all of my neighbor's houses, the, the, the school my dad went to elementary school in 90 years ago, whatever. It burned everything. So, um, I am wondering why, like, there was no uh, uh, acceptance of any input from people who had know-how um, on this fire and why uh, it wasn't put out when it was small instead of burning all of our houses down. Like, I, I really just wanna know who made the decision, like a name, who made that decision? Yeah, thank you, Karen. I appreciate that and super sorry to hear about the, um, the structural loss. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, provide an answer for that. Chief Armstrong, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, Karen, thank you for the uh, thank you very much for the question. And to echo uh, Chief Cox, uh, sorry for the losses that you and your your folks experienced. Um, I don't want to. Uh, I'll, I'll try to break it down a little bit, and I'll try to first address uh, the part that I can. And I think I saw. Uh, did you post uh, the, a similar question in the written format as well? Oh, you may have already muted. Um, I'll, I'll try to kind of take that from the beginning and tell you everything I know about it. Um, so we had resources on that on that Waddell fire uh, continuously since um, that 16th when we first had put folks on it. Um, we do have a certain, sometimes tactics might not be understood. So we try to, for safety's sake, they need to fight fire directly as much as possible, meaning that they are putting the fire out as they go along the line. So rather than just driving uh, up a road sometimes into an area where they could be quickly burned over, they have to form what's called an anchor point. So we like to start uh, fighting that fire from a known point, which would be down below. Um, as far as answering I can't answer specifics as far as this road or who told them or, or, or any of that. Um, but as far as the resources being pulled off of that fire, um, I did see that question in the, in the kind of the chat function. Resources were on that fire continuously until they were pulled off because the fire was already in last chance. The Waddell fire was not what burned in the last chance. The resources that were on the hill that uh, that were directly on the fire line on the Waddell fire were who was able to look across the can and that, that's who we pulled off to go fight the fire in, in last chance or attempt to fight the fire in last chance. Um, that fire that encroached on last chance, we couldn't see at night because that was the 5-14 fire that was coming from uh, in within San Mateo County. So I, um, that moved from the north where there wasn't anybody on the line because that was that really rapid fire growth that we saw. Uh, I, I, I don't think that's gonna answer your question in a way that you're happy with, um, but we did have firefighters on that line continuously until, or, or at least assigned to that fire 
until they had to be pulled off to go to last chance. Uh, and then that fire was eventually enveloped by the rest of the large body of, of fire uh, once it made its way th that far enough south and west. All right, next we'll go to Fred Gibbs. Fred, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Are you there, Fred? Go ahead. All right, Fred, uh, last opportunity. Do you have a question? Can you hear us? All right, not hearing Fred, we'll uh, move on to Crystal. Go Hello, ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, we got you. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, one point I just wanted to point out is the loss of life that we had in Last Chance. The fact that it was only one is solely due to our neighbors looking out for each other. The evac warning was way too late. And I am not here to piss on anybody. I just want to know how this won't happen in the future. I personally evacuated my animals and myself on Monday. By Tuesday morning was very concerned. By Tuesday afternoon, when I drove the coast from the Waddell fire to the Butano, I flipped out and called my neighborhood and knew what was gonna happen. And I'm not a firefighter. So I want some answers about that. Thanks, Crystal. Uh, Chief Larkin, do you wanna take that? Yeah, yeah, Crystal, as I pointed out in our, uh, our lessons learned, uh, we, we are looking at our fuel types very differently and how we uh, address uh, that specifically as it relates to evacuations. Uh, in the future, evacuations, um, especially in the remote areas of the county, if we do have fires in that area, <clears throat> will be evacuated much earlier, um, at, at least notifying the, the community that, hey, you need to leave. Uh, and then it's up to them to make that personal choice whether they stay or leave. So um, we are working on that to, to, to make it uh, a, a higher priority for us um, now that we have uh, seen how these uh, fuel types that typically don't burn in this manner uh, are burning. So um, that, that's how we're going to address that moving in the future. Um, you know, last chance is a, um, a, a remote uh, area and uh, you know, there's only a certain amount of uh, uh, line, phone lines that go back into that area and cell service is pretty bad. So we're gonna have to concentrate on doing that on a door to door type basis and working with the sheriff's department on getting uh, folks out there well in advance uh, to get folks out of there. Um, one thing I can say is um, we did not expect this fire uh, to burn in the, the method with the uh, uh, veracity, the intensity, and the speed in which it did uh, when it came out of San Mateo County. Uh, it had been progressing. It was putting up, uh, you know, a, a good column of smoke, but nobody anticipated this fire to burn like that uh, uh, in the fuel types that it was burning in. But thank you for the question. I appreciate that. Hopefully I was able to answer that for you. All right, next question, we'll go to Joe C. Your hand is raised. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Joe. Okay, so uh, real quick questions. Uh, my questions are, um, at what time on Tuesday, August 18th, were evacuation orders for last chance first spoke of? And who was in charge of putting the, the orders into place to evacuate last chance? All right. Thank you for your question, Joe. Uh, the question was specifically what time on the 18th uh, were the last chance evacuations called for and who was responsible? And Chief Larkin? So um, if, if I'm, I'm going to recall back to last chance on the, that night on the 18th, I believe those evacuation orders started around the first initial calls uh, that were delivered through the reverse 911 system, I believe were around 920 um, to that area. Um, so those evacuation orders went in around that 930, 920, 930 uh, period of time. Uh, but it does take the Sheriff's Department a little bit to react and get folks out to that area. Uh, and the reverse 911 system was probably a little bit ahead of them. So in essence, it was probably closer to 10 o'clock before the Sheriff was out there to do any kind of a uh, door-to-door uh, -door on that 18th, late, late evening on the 18th. 
And those evacuation orders come from the incident command structure that we have in place. Based on the information that we had, uh, we started making those orders uh, in a sequence of where we knew the fire was in relation to those, those areas. Um, and uh, it was a while before we uh, uh, knew that the fire had burnt down to the upper end of last chance. Chief, if I can just add to that a little bit, uh, as Chief Larkin just mentioned, you know, um, the fire impacted many of these areas after the sun had gone down and we no longer had aircraft on the fire. And um, our very first notice of the need for evacuations uh, was basically right around uh, sundown as that fire started to encroach on the Boulder Creek community. And so that was, uh, you know, we were basically at the point there in the evening hours. Remember also, I'm gonna backpedal just one second and um, to say that the vast majority of the firefighters that we had on the line that night of the 18th, we had a couple of folks down on the Warinella, uh, just uh, kind of buttoning that one up. We had some folks on uh, the Waddell fire there on the coast. The rest of the firefighters were in the sticks, they were back off uh, roads that they had to cut their way into in San Mateo County. And that fire outran them and they didn't, for lack of a better, we didn't know where that edge of the fire was being the nighttime hours until it started to impact uh, that Boulder Creek area. At that point, it is the drive time to drive off of that fire line uh, and basically do a big roundabout to get into Boulder Creek and Bonnie Dune and these other populated areas to actually get back on that fire's edge. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it was a significant haul just, just to be able to move those folks. So in, in going back to what Chief was mentioning, we were at that point not knowing where exactly that fire threat was because that fire was moving so fast through uh, the forest until we were getting the call that, hey, the fire is here. And while we were focusing on that, um, that uh, fire encroaching on, on Boulder Creek and, uh, and getting into Bonnie Dune was when we got our first reports there about um, the fire was actually encroaching on that, uh, on the basically the far uh, north end of Last Chance. It was uh, kind of an intelligence, uh, you know, a lack of uh, gaining enough intelligence on, on where exactly that fire was in those nighttime hours. All right, we uh, will go next to uh, our first upvoted question. Um, and that is about uh, from Brian Dean. Uh, the question is, can we get information for all of the backfires set? Yeah, Chief Cox, I'll take that question. Um, so um, we're not gonna comment on any of the backfires uh, that may have been set or allegedly were set. Um, we do have uh, um, a couple complaints that have been filed and we are investigating uh, those uh, as we um, uh, as we speak. So um, I really don't have anything to comment on that. Um, what I can say uh, is fire as a tool for us um, in the essence of fighting fire with fire. Um, there are times where backfires are set uh, in both an offensive and defensive manner. So um, uh, we're looking into uh, the, the, the questions that have been asked uh, in relation to those. Uh, and when we have more definitive answers, uh, on that, we'll be able to provide additional uh, information. But at this time, we have uh, no additional information we can provide. All right. Our next question is from Chris. There were many neighborhood fire brigades that were very successful saving many homes. They were told by CAL FIRE to leave the area because it was unsafe. However, they remained. My concern as a public health nurse is that my neighbors have no trust for CAL FIRE because of this fire. How is CAL FIRE going to repair trust in the community? so that lives are not endangered in the future if there is a really unsafe fire? So um, I'll, I'll take that one, uh, Chief Cox. Um, so, you know, um, a lot of folks did stay. A lot of folks saved homes. Um, you know, uh, I, I applaud them for, for their efforts in, in, in that as, as essence. But what I can say um, is, uh, you know, uh, the trust of CAL FIRE, um, you know, we had an extraordinary event that occurred here, 12,000 lightning strikes, uh, 585 fires in the state, 24 of those are major fires. Our entire state resource allocation through the mutual aid system is drawn down to its absolute bare minimums. 
Uh, we committed every resource that we had available to us, um, uh, both locally, as well as uh, using our mutual aid partners in our neighboring counties that would give us whatever we could beg and borrow from them uh, to help us uh, in this event. Uh, what I can say is we dodged a bullet. Um, the community dodged a bullet. Uh, those people that stayed, um, you know what? I, a lot of those are, are, are retired firefighters or professional firefighters that are trained uh, to do this kind of work. But if you don't have the tools to do the work, um, that can be very dangerous. Uh, and we uh, averted a, a weather pattern that was predicted to come through. I believe it was on the 20th or the 21st. It may have been the 22nd now, I can't remember. Uh, that was supposed to bring us um, uh, significant winds and potentially uh, thunderstorms to the area, which can create downdrafts that can blow a fire out and blow it up to where it could have been just like the night of the 18th into the 19th, where we had this extreme fire behavior with rapid runs that if people were in that area, it would have killed them. So what I can say is um, we are going to do our best to avert this from ever happening again, but I can't guarantee that's going to happen. Um, if we have 12,000 lightning strikes come through uh, this next fire season, I don't have a guarantee that we're going to be able to get resources here uh, to protect us to the level that we would need to suppress the fires. So we're going to do our damnedest to try to do that, uh, but I can't guarantee that that's going to happen. So um, what I can say is for those, um, you know, do your defensible space, make your, make your home defendable, a standalone structure, uh, and leave. Um, you know, grab the belongings that you can, uh, leave the structure, um, and, and, and let us get in and do what we can with the resources we have available. Um, you know, we had several folks that were in and around uh, uh, different areas of the community uh, that decided to stay that um, due to circumstances were pulling our resources away from perimeter control uh, that, where they would have to go deal with something that was really um, not a significant event uh, and it really had minimal threat uh, to anything. So um, it, it's very troublesome to me that uh, folks would uh, do that, but what I can say is some of the folks that stayed did a great job. You saved structures. Uh, we got lucky this time. Uh, next time, we may not be so lucky. All right, that next question from Matthew Kaufman. When will we all agree that defensible space only matters if fire crews will come defend? And since they won't in a fire like this, we need to switch to either houses that can protect themselves or we'll just watch them burn. I can tell you, I can, I can't tell you how many thousands I spent on defensible space only to watch on video as crews left my neighborhood and let it burn. Chief, I'll comment on that. Uh, if you don't mind, and Matthew, thank you for the question. Um, you know, um, I'd have to say that nine times out of 10, defensible space uh, does an amazing job, if not more than, if not 99 uh, times out of 100. And if this were the, the usual small initial attack fire that had started in your neighborhood, um, that we had a full wildland response responding to, that defensible space would do worlds for you uh, because it would give those, those crews that were dedicated to just that small neighborhood, uh, you know, the, the, the chance to really make a great effort and a great save on your property. Uh, I'm sorry, the question just disappeared. So I, I, I'm gonna have to kind of go off memory here. Um, but uh, as far as folks uh, coming into the neighborhood and leaving, uh, one, I can tell you 100%, there was no let it burn uh, policy. There, there wasn't a strategy of that or a mindset of that by any means. Um, what we do get in situations, extraordinary situations like this, and I'm very sorry for, for your loss and, and the unfortunate circumstances, but uh, with the, I know we sound like a broken record and I'm sorry for that, but with the sheer lack of resources that we had, we do have to fall back in some respect on, on the greatest uh, possibility of good for those resources. So there may have been resources patrolling that area, waiting for a fire to pop up in that area uh, that they could easily uh, contain. And if that wasn't the possibility, if it, you know there was just one engine that was available to patrol there, either one, uh, you know, the, by the time fire got into your neighborhood, it was maybe maybe it was too much for the limited number of resources. The other thing is, there were typically uh, those resources are going to gravitate to where they can do the most good, to where one or two engines can make it stand and save an entire street. So I, I again, I know that's not what you want to hear, and I'm sorry for your loss, um, but there, there's the defensible space 
has proven itself time and time again. These were extraordinary circumstances. Um, and some that just doesn't matter how it seems like you could have 100 feet of defensible space. If something lands just perfect, you could still be threatened. So sorry about that. All right, next question from Blue Foreman. Is there any way to gauge the likelihood of another, another devastating fire of this magnitude in the near future? Some people say in another one in another 100 years. But I see about 100 million dead trees that look like gin ginormous kindling piles throughout Bonnie Doon. How should we realistically plan at this point? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, you know, that, that's a really good question and I appreciate it and I thank you for that question. Um, what I can say is, you know, um, this fire did not burn uh, completely and fully clean through the entire area of Bonnie Doon. There is a tremendous amount of fuel left uh, in Bonnie Doon that will carry fire. Even during the fire, we had those concerns The as I stated, if that weather event would have uh, materialized and we would have got downdrafts, that there was enough fuel that we would have had, uh, you know, uh, a significant uh, issue in Bonnie Doon uh, all over again, even though the fire had uh, made its first run through there. So um, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, I know the county is addressing some of those issues with some of the down uh, stockpiled fuel um, in that recovery phase. Uh, and I also know that PG&E is dealing with uh, some of the down trees that they've done in the right-of-way clearances uh, as we move forward. Um, but uh, what I will say is, um, you know, defensible space is, is a key element and reducing fuels uh, is, uh, you know, one of our, our goals is to get better at that and get more involved in the community to do that. Uh, I, I want to point out, you know, uh, upper um, Empire Grade, um, near uh, Crest Christmas Tree Ranch. Uh, there's a shaded fuel break that was put in there uh, a few years back. Um, and uh, that shaded fuel break, um, if you drive into that area, you can see where the intensity of that fire was lessened when it burnt through that shaded fuel break. So, uh, you know, uh, doing that kind of work and reducing those fuels um, is going to be a, a key indicator uh, of, of that. But um, it, it's going to take, you know, a, a lot of effort and a lot of funding uh, to be able to. Um, do that fuels mitigation that uh, that you referenced in your question. So I hope I was able to answer that. All right. Next question is from Holiday Smith. What can we do to advocate for greater resources for Cal Fire? Clearly, the current resources are inadequate given the increasingly dangerous conditions. I was really hoping that Chief Larkin was going to take this one because I could answer this one for way too long. Um, Holiday, thank you for the question. And um, I will ask Chief Larkin to weigh in a little bit. Um, something that we didn't really, uh, Cal Fire, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head, uh, hurting a little bit for resources. We're, uh, uh, we got hit pretty hard uh, this last year due to um, COVID-19 and budget cuts. Um, we were slated to add some 500 positions this last year um, in the governor's budget and all that was cut um, j just due to the projected budget for, uh, shortfall. 2020 was hard for everything. Uh, we have uh, Cal Fire through a cooperative effort with um, CDCR, uh, California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Uh, we're, we're slated for 198 fire crews uh, statewide. Those are um, um, low risk offender inmates uh, that are uh, led by CAL FIRE captains. Uh, of those 198, uh, due to uh, depopulation of um, uh, prisons, early releases, and other uh, COVID struggles, we were down to less than 90 of those 190 fire crews at the time of, of this fire. And so um, the states had to get pretty creative. Um, we. Uh, hire back extra firefighters and put together firefighter hand crews uh, rather than having those inmate crews. Uh, we're entering into new cooperative agreements with um, uh, the California Conservation Corps uh, and the California National Guard to staff those fire crews. So it's not for lack of trying. We're, uh, we're definitely uh, trying to increase uh, staffing at all times. We'd like to see double what we have. Uh, Chief can speak kind of to more of the history uh, going back to budget cuts of the early 90s, uh, I forget how many fire engines we had at that time, but um, we're, we're just struggling to get back up to a total of 400 in the state. So um, thank you for your support and the question. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it back to Chief, uh, what, you, what you can do locally to advocate for um, uh, more CAL FIRE resources. 
Yeah, um, I can just give you a little history on it and I'll, I'll try to make it quick so we don't waste too much time on it. But, uh, you know, in the early 90s, uh, CAL FIRE took a significant uh, budget reduction, uh, which uh, was a reduction uh, ultimately in resources. Um, uh, here, just locally in the San Mateo Santa Cruz unit, um, we lost um, three fire engines and a bulldozer uh, at that point. Um, just recently, uh, in the last uh, two years, we were able to uh, uh, get allocated funding back to replace one of those engines. Um, so we're back to 13 engines where um, we used to uh, be at 15 engines in uh, this unit. So uh, the allocation of resources, that's a legislative act. Um, we are a, a, a funded through the, uh, the state's budget. Um, so that would be a legislative act uh, to get additional funding for that. Um, you know, um, when, when there's no fires, um, we have our mutual aid system is robust. Um, I know Chief Armstrong alluded to this earlier. Um, you know, I'll, I'll use the Lockheed fire. Uh, I was the initial attack IC on that fire. Um, the next morning when I uh, rolled in to give the operational briefing that morning, um, you know, I had almost 800 firefighters at briefing that morning. Um, within two days, we had 1,500 uh, firefighters fighting that fire. Um, here, um, we, we barely met 1,500 six, seven days into the fire, uh, and we did a max of 2,400 at the peak of the incident, which was, uh, you know, I think it was eight or 10 days into the fire. So um, it, it comes down to the sheer supply and demand statewide. So um, that advocacy, uh, to really answer your question, rolls back to um, uh, getting to the legislature to uh, help uh, push that um, agenda for budget increases. All right, we'll switch back to our participants with the raised hands and see if we can answer some more of those questions. And we'll go ahead and start off with Sophie. Hi, yes. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to answer the questions. And I know there's a lot of tough questions that you're trying to answer. Um, everything outside of my, my property, thankfully, didn't burn. Everything probably five feet outside of my property burned. Everything in my backyard um, driveway, we just moved in. Boxes are burned. Um, my backyard basically is a forest. So there are dead leaves and trees that is outside of my property everywhere. What is the plan to clear out all of this fuel before the next fire season? Because I've already spent about $10,000 of my money to clear out as much as I can on my property, but I cannot clear the entire forest that's burned behind my house. I'm only one mile north of uh, uh, the town in Boulder Creek um, off of 236. So there's a lot of burned trees on the hill in front of me and behind me. So what is uh, the plan to clear all of this fuel before the next fire season comes? Because what if, uh, you know, the other side of Highway 9 burns and the fire comes this way, everything's going to go up. The whole town's going to go up if it's not cleared. I would like to know what your plan is to clear that. Um, so, Sophia, Chief, Chief Cox, I'll take this question. Sophia, I appreciate the question and uh, thanks for that. Um, so, um, it really comes down to who is the owner of the property uh, that is adjacent to you. So, that property owner is responsible for uh, clearing that property. So, I would assume that you're uh, backing up to some type of public land. Um, uh, based on your question. Uh, so if that's the case, um, uh, working with that, uh, that property owner to clear that property, um, uh, and, and some of that can come with uh, grant money uh, in a larger project, maybe with your entire community getting involved uh, with fire safe councils, um, with CAL FIRE, your local fire protection district uh, to work on um, you know, getting that fuel reduction uh, done. So um, uh, our specific plan to your specific question uh, really relates back to um, you know, who's that property owner and what can we do to assist you uh, in getting that property cleared uh, for your entire community um, uh, as a preemptive manner. So um, uh, it might be that we need to take your question uh, offline. Um, hopefully there's an email that uh, was attached to your question, or if you can uh, email in through the uh, survey, we might be able to get some additional information to you for that. All right, next we will go to Claire Weber. Uh, you will be unmuted. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, my question is also about next summer on White House uh, Canyon Road. We've we've had a lot of like medium burn, so we have a lot of live oaks that have been fried by the fire, but they're dead, but they have all their leaves. And I wanted to know, like the the fire risk is 
is there, but is it increased because we're in a burn area or is it decreased? Because I, I'm seeing on one hand that the, there is more dried uh, dead trees, but on the other hand, the ridges have been cleared of all fuels, so that would limit uh, any risk of fire jumping to the canyon. What What is uh, your experience? Chief Cox, I could take this. Uh, Claire, so I uh, appreciate uh, the question and, and thank you. Um, you know, uh, that, that um, those dead trees that are there, those oaks, uh, you know, that is fuel. Um, what really is going to be uh, a, a, a key element of that is what ground fuels are around that area that could potentially carry fuel to that dead uh, dead fuel. So it's going to be important to make sure that uh, those areas are clear of that ground fuel um, so that uh, uh, fire doesn't have the uh, ability to get in and, and start those dead fuels, uh, which become more receptive uh, because they're drying out much faster uh, because they're dead. So um, it's really going to be incumbent on uh, making sure that that area is clear, the roadway is clear, uh, and that you keep those ladder fuels uh, and those ground fuels um, out from around all that dead uh, uh, vegetation. All right, next question, we'll go to Bob Berlinch. Bob? Can you hear me? Yeah, Hello? go ahead, Bob. Yeah, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I lost my home on August 20th and probably 90% of my possessions. Uh, I personally knew the individual who died in that fire. Um, I want to thank you for your presentation, uh, but it was also extremely difficult to relive all of that. I, I just turned 70 and I hope I never have to go through anything like that with what's left of my life. Um, I guess I have a question for Chief Larkin. Uh, I have a number of comments and potential suggestions moving forward. Uh, and I have some comments, particularly with respect to the slide that said lessons learned. Um, uh, Chief Larkin, at the beginning of the presentation, said that this is not this was not to be an after incident review. And my question to Chief Larkin is, will there be such a thing? And what will that look like? And what kind of information will be collected? Uh, and when will that happen? And will the public have an opportunity to participate in, in that? Um, and lastly, it's my 48th year in the forest products industry and dealing with forestry issues. And I just want to say if there's a single take home message in all of this in here on the central coast, there's it's such a small area compared to forest land elsewhere in the world. And the, the Santa Cruz County Grand Jury pointed out that we have the, the highest percentage of wild land urban interface. And I think the take home message to all of us is if, if there's a fire, whether it's in a crown or if it's just creeping along in understory, we all have to find a way to take that more seriously and, and find an instantaneous response to fires in this area, because if, if this fire did nothing else, it proved to us that just because of fires are creeping along on the ground doesn't mean it's going to blow up on the, on the entire geography in a nanosecond. Yeah, Bob, uh, thank you for your question. And uh, um, in, in relation to uh, uh, two parts of that is uh, your last statement there. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, typically uh, in Santa Cruz County and even in San Mateo County, we we tend to keep our fires very small um, in, in size and acreage, uh, but uh, as we're all well aware, um, we, we live in a forested area that has no real fire history uh, in the last hundred years of recorded fire history. Uh, so our fires take a little while to uh, fully suppress because we're dealing with you know anywhere from a foot to sometimes three to four feet of duff that we have to get in and mop up. So uh, in relation to that, uh, you know uh, we've we've done a very good job over the years of trying to keep our fires small. Um, we've had some very, um, you know, large fires. Uh, you know, the Lockheed was just under 8,000 acres. The Summit Fire was uh, 4,000 acres. So this county has the potential 
uh, for large loss, um, uh, devastating fires. Um, but typically because of our weather pattern and the great fuel moisture recovery we get with the uh, average rainfall of, you know, sometimes upwards of 100 inches a year, uh, it's helpful. Um, but uh, that has lessened with that uh, drought that we spoke about earlier and the change in our climate and how our fuel moistures are dropping drastically and they're not recovering. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm nervous about this coming fire season. Uh, we have not seen the uh, uh, significant recovery in our fuel moistures uh, to date, uh, and that's due to the lack of rain that we have. So um, uh, it, it's, it's going to be a nerve wracking year uh, as we move forward into fire season. Um, but I really want to get back to your first question uh, about the after action review. You're absolutely right. This is not meant to be an after action review. Uh, and is a CAL FIRE going to do an after action review? Uh, and my answer to you is the local unit is not doing an after action review of this incident. Um, we went back, we looked at some of the key elements uh, that we felt uh, were contributing factors um, to this fire. And our one key element and factor was the sheer lack of resources. So um, doing a full after action review based on that specifically um, really isn't gonna generate any uh, change in, um, in what, what is there other than there was a, a total um, dynamic that drained the available resources down to uh, minimum drawdown level statewide to where we had to enact uh, EMAC to go for resources that are out of, out of state um, between uh, um, uh, getting those additional resources here. So. Um, I believe, I, I don't know if um, um, uh, Michael Beaton would like to speak to it, but I think the county was talking about the potential for a after action review, but I would have to defer to them to uh, determine if that uh, is the case. Michael, do you want to take that? Yeah, uh, thank you, Chief. Uh, and, uh, you know, I apologize for uh, uh, um, your, your property in your house um, burning down. Uh, for the County of Santa Cruz, uh, I'm Michael Beaton. I'm the Director of General Services and the EOC Director uh, during the incident of the CZU Lightning Complex fire. Uh, the county is uh, in the process of developing a uh, strategy to do and continue to do an after action review for the county, uh, which includes a, a survey that we're asking for, for folks after the end of this call to submit data into. Uh, we'll start collecting. Uh, it is an ongoing after action. We plan on having a uh, an actionable report um, sometime in May uh, with the finalized report, I believe uh, about nine months after. Uh, as you know, these take time. Uh, everything that we learn from everybody on this call, uh, we take it as an actionable item and we actually start incorporating it into our plans, including our upcoming fire. Uh, so I hope that helps answer the question um, with a little bit off of what Chief Larkin identified. All right, thank you. Uh, next we'll go to Alan Lind. Hello, and thank you very much for taking my call. And I would really like to thank you and your crews. Uh, from what I saw of the difficulty of this fire, it's a miracle that there wasn't more loss of life and that even more homes weren't lost. So as near as I could tell, you guys did uh, more than could be expected with fewer resources than you needed. But looking ahead, there is one question I have it seems to me these fires are to some degree unfightable in the current situation because there just aren't decent fire breaks in these mountains. But there could be, it seems to me. Each and every road, each and every driveway could have a shaded fuel break cut back 50 feet on either side. That would result in a hundred foot wide fuel break carving this mountain up into to portions that might actually be defensible. In your opinion, would that be useful if the residents here could work toward on their own properties, 100 foot wide fuel breaks spanning all the roads and driveways? Thanks for your question, Alan. Uh, I'll leave that to either uh, Chief Armstrong or Chief Larkin. Yeah, Alan, uh, thank, you, thank you for your question. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. We can do more. And, uh, you know, one of the topics in our lessons learned, I talked about that defensible space. And, uh, you know, that, that's one of those is creating that defensible space. And uh, I also talked about the shaded fuel break projects that we have been engaged in, uh, in parts of the county, uh, such as up on um, uh, Empire Grade, uh, that had a 
uh, an impact on uh, reducing the uh, fire intensity as it burnt through that area. So uh, you're absolutely right. There needs to be more effort, effort and uh, uh, put forward for that, um, that type of fuel uh, work being done. Um, I'm entering my 33rd year in the fire service. And uh, I can tell you when I worked uh, in this unit as a seasonal firefighter back in 1990 and 91, um, we had much better fuel breaks uh, in this county. Uh, I recall uh, as a young firefighter uh, going out on the engine company and doing uh, work on the fuel breaks, uh, making sure the culverts were clean uh, and doing brush trimming to make sure that they were passable by the fire engines and that we reduce those ladder fuels um, and then they would come back out in the uh, wintertime and uh, take the piles that we had created and they would burn them uh, to reduce that fuel even more. Um, we used to do a lot more prescribed burning in, in Big Basin State Park uh, back uh, in those days as well. Um, uh, I know uh, I came back to this unit in 2004 and one of my primary things was when I promoted to battalion chief was uh, to, to implore the ability to try to use fire as a tool for us uh, and do more uh, prescribed burns. And I've been an advocate of that ever since uh, uh, till this day, we still uh, burn more acres in this unit uh, than we have in probably the last 30 to 40 years uh, in totality. So uh, I totally agree. We need to have a, a better um, uh, process in place working with our uh, cooperative uh, uh, folks as our fire safe councils, our RCDs, uh, looking for grant funding because all this type of work takes money uh, and it takes people. Uh, and there's just not enough of that uh, available um, to, to go around without that extra work being put forward. But uh, thank you for your question. Chief, if I may, just as a, as a side note of that, besides taking uh, uh, people and money, it also takes time. And um, we have a finite uh, amount of staff. And as the fire season has grown from a fire season that was five to six months here in the local area where those resources were able to focus on nothing but fuel reduction uh, in the winter, uh, that fire season has now grown to be, we, we didn't um, separate our last seasonals or, you know, our seasonal firefighters until December this year. And, and we're going to be looking to rehire them in just a couple of months. So, uh, you know, the, the fire season has grown to an extent where it hasn't given us uh, much anymore of a fuel reduction season where we, we typically got to do a lot of that work. And we're, we're struggling right now to uh, make that work uh, with, with the growing fire year. All right, we'll take one more uh, question from a raised hand. And uh, why don't we go to uh, Carol Beth Shannon. Thank you for taking my question. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, this really makes me nervous. I'm even more nervous now about the next fire season than I was before. And um, about a year and a half ago, we did a, a fire <clears throat> seminar that Cal Fire participated in and um, Assemblyman Stone's office and McPherson, it was McPherson and, and Jay um, D. Brown was uh, worked with me in putting it together. And it was very well attended at the Scotts Valley Community Center. Um, we had several hundred people there as well. And Cal Fire had all their flyers and everything. And they really stressed about defensible space. So after that seminar, and we mailed brochures to everyone in Rolling Woods, Pasa Tiempo, Woods Cove, Lockwood Lane, all that in this area. And um, I didn't see a lot of homeowners doing anything on defensible space. So Chief Larkin, I guess, you know, the question is to you because I would like to know specifically what can be done to have homeowners do a defensible space. I have three homeowners right around me that they have done nothing. You know, and I contacted this um, Scotts Valley Fire Department and they said, all we can do is drive by. And if we see something in the drive by, then we can address it, but we can't go onto the property. So specifically, 
what is it that CAL FIRE is gonna do to encourage people to develop a defensible space? That's my question. Thank hey, you. Carol. Carol, thank you for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, and you know, that, that, is a, that is a good question. Um, you know, uh, uh, I live within the Scotts Valley Fire Protection District and, and I know they go out and do defensible space inspections. Uh, I know I've had one done on my residence. Um, so I, I know that's a, a available to the fire district. Um, uh, you know, the specific um, uh, trying to get somebody to do defensible space uh, is difficult. Um, you know, uh, you may have the best defend defendable home uh, in the neighborhood, but if your neighbors aren't doing it, um, a lot of the times it's not going to uh, always work out for everybody in the neighborhood. And, uh, you know, this is a prime example of this fire. Um, uh, there are uh, numerous examples of just that where um, you had a house on uh, the left that did not have defensible space that burnt down. The house on the right, uh, you could tell that there was good clearance around it, but it burned down as well, even though they had defensible space. But the house on the right didn't have defensible space, which in turn, the house that was actually had good defensible space and somewhat protected the other house to the right that did not have defensible space, and it's still standing. So uh, there are a lot of examples of uh, exactly what you're doing, uh, what you're saying. So um, specifically to what CAL FIRE can do, um, once again, this is really a consorted effort of getting your uh, your neighborhood together, uh, everybody, I mean, if this was not an example of what can happen uh, in this county, I don't know what is. Um, I, I've been in, back in this county working here since 2004. Uh, I've been through, with the exception of one of the fires, I've been uh, a part of the, all the major fires that we had, uh, the Summit Fire, the Martin Fire. Um, I was not here for the Trading, but I was here for the Loma and I was here for the Lockheed. And I was here for the CZU Lightning Complex. So I've seen um, what can occur in this county. And I've been a starch advocate of, of expressing that, that it's not a matter of if it's going to happen. It's a matter of when it's going to happen. Um, you know, I expressed the, uh, our concern about, you know, we're going to really start to enforce our defensible space inspections uh, more greatly. But uh, our local fire uh, protection districts also have um, you know, the responsibility to go out and do that in, in their areas as well. And um, this will be a topic that I bring up uh, to our county fire chiefs uh, as I sit as a current standing president of that association. Uh, I will bring that up and uh, we will start to try to get that conversation uh, started on what we can do to better uh, support the communities. Uh, but I, uh, I would really reach out to your local fire protection district uh, and push a little bit harder on them uh, to uh, help you in that effort uh, in your community. Um, and I know there's different chipping programs and things that uh, are available, um, you know, as uh, the county fire chief, you know, uh, we're, we're planning on trying to involve ourselves more in that process uh, as well uh, from the county fire department side in our fuel reduction efforts uh, to help um, our, our communities. Uh, but in general, um, that's what CAL FIRE can do. We can help coordinate that. We can help uh, open that conversation uh, and, and bring them to the table to hopefully be able to uh, get uh, compliance in those communities to make it safer for you all. All right, so we have a couple um, minutes left. We have some kind of themes coming out on these questions at the moment. And maybe one we should uh, uh, answer a little bit more is talking about evacuations. Uh, a lot of concern about when they were called for and how they were called for. Um, I don't know if we could just give a little bit of information about um, uh, how evacuations are called for and what the process is and what goes into it. Yeah, um, Jonathan, I'd be happy to, uh, Chief, if it's okay, I'd be happy to field that question because I see the one from Julia there in the uh, in the questions and um, I and Chief can add to this when I'm done, but uh, I, I answered this a little bit before, but I'll reiterate now. Um, it's not that CAL FIRE wasn't concerned about evacuations, uh, but uh, as I stated before, the, the three fires that combined to make uh, the large fire burned through miles uh, in those evening hours, literally miles. And as Chief stated before, uh, th this burned in a way that no fire has ever burned in Santa Cruz County before. Uh, so, and unfortunately that happened in the evening hours when we can't actually see where that fire's edge was. So, uh, and having to reposition all those resources to actually get to a, to a fire's edge to see what needed to be evacuated. So 
Uh, like I say, the fire had never burned that way before. It's not that we weren't concerned. We didn't think it would ever burn through five or six miles in the evening hours that, uh, it, you know, and kind of um, ca catch us running. So uh, there's uh, that end. And then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the question disappeared again. Uh, like I say, it's not that we weren't concerned. It's just that we did not expect it to go where it did that even no, nobody would have. And Chief, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, so um, I can just elaborate a little bit more on the process and how evacuations are called for. So um, uh, as I mentioned in our presentation that uh, um, uh, on the afternoon of the 18th, we had entered into a unified command structure uh, with the local sheriff's departments in both counties. Um, we had representatives uh, here uh, with us at the command post from both representing both of the counties. Uh, and, uh, you know, we started our planning process. We had our uh, evacuation management platform out. We were looking at all the zones that we were uh, planning to, uh, you know, start to evacuate if the need arose. And uh, as soon as we uh, got the indication that we had uh, fires spotting, uh, the distance that they were spotting, those evacuation notices went into effect immediately. Um, and, and we were working side by side, hand in hand with the sheriff's department, uh, with our um, uh, reverse 911 system through uh, NETCOM uh, to get these alerts out as fast as possible and get deputies out on the ground and other law enforcement agencies that were participating. Um, and one thing you got to uh, think to, to look at in evacuations um, uh, is the systematic approach to those. Um, if you go out and you try to mass evacuate a large area, especially like the San Lorenzo Valley, if we were to take the entire valley and say, everybody get out, um, you're going to just have the roads plugged up because they're small, narrow mountain roads. So um, in, in a manner, we took a systematic approach and started the most um, uh, uh, endangered uh, properties and people and started moving them as quickly as possible. Um, as Chief Armstrong said, um, nobody expected that fire to burn uh, into last chance at the rate that it burned into. And as soon as we heard that the fire had reached a, a certain spot in last chance, those orders went out immediately. Um, hindsight, looking back at it, uh, as I said earlier, um, based on how our fuels uh, reacted in this fire, uh, we are going to have to look at evacuations much earlier uh, in our processes uh, based on the fuels here. You know, we've, we, we've lived in an area where we've had fires, but we really haven't been subjected to fires uh, and this type of fuel. You know, a lot of it was redwood um, uh, forest that burned, and it burnt with um, uh, extreme intensity and extreme speed as it moved through the crowns uh, of that uh, of that area. So, uh, but that process is a combination and co uh, coordinated effort with the sheriff's department. Um, we make the recommendations, and the sheriff's department actually out goes out and actually enforces the evacuation and makes the official order um, uh, for that to occur. And I don't know if uh, Sheriff Hart had anything uh, you wanted to add to that or not, or if I was able to answer that quickly enough. Yeah, no, thanks, Chief Larkin. Uh, good evening, everybody. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, to say that that these evacuation orders are, they're made with great care and the, the program that's being used now is very effective. Um, I, I just remember a conversation you and I had when, when that fire was hunkered down in San Mateo and you and I spoke at about two in the afternoon. I think it was the first day of the fire around the 18th or so. And you said, you know, you felt like that, it, it was okay because it was just sort of nestled down. And then a few hours later, you, you said, we've never seen anything like this. This thing just took off on us. And I think it has to do with these fuels that you're talking about. But uh, certainly the, the evacuation of last chance, uh, had we uh, had advanced information, we would have been up there. We sent deputies up there. We were met by uh, fire personnel who said, yeah, the fire's coming down. And, and so we, we, we did not get into last chance uh, late that evening because the, the fire was already coming down. All right. <clears throat> last kind of uh, thematic question that's come out is really about um, volunteers and the use of volunteers during fires. Um, a lot of questions around why weren't we working with local volunteer firefighters and why weren't um, impromptu volunteers allowed to fight the fire? Yeah. So, uh, and, and I see that question from Antonia and, and, and thank you, Antonia. Um, to answer your question, we were working with the local volunteer firefighters. Uh, as we stated earlier, uh, there, there's five volunteer companies under Santa Cruz County Fire that uh, CAL FIRE uh, 
uh, administers in the county. And uh, there were members from all five of those uh, companies engaged in this fire at some point. At one point when the fire did get into the community of Bonnie Dune, some of those uh, uh, volunteers were, were caring for their own homes. Uh, but we did still have uh, members of all of the other companies uh, kind of ingrained with our own personnel, staffing uh, equipment got for at least a, a week and a half to two weeks into this fire. Chief, sorry. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, Chief Cox, uh, I know we're, we're coming up on our 7.30 uh, uh, closeout here. Um, we only had a reserved uh, community meeting for two hours. Uh, I wanna thank everybody uh, for your participation. Uh, the questions that were in the Q&A, uh, we are gonna work to try to get the ones that we did not get to answered uh, and provide that feedback. Uh, once again, um, you can uh, also uh, email the CZU fire questions at fire.ca.gov. Uh, any questions, comments, uh, and uh, as always, you um, uh, can call my office line, area code 831-335-6700. Uh, and we will be sending out a final survey uh, to everybody uh, that registered uh, to participate in the, the meeting uh, to allow you some additional um, uh, inputs and answer some questions uh, in that survey. So um, I, I just want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, thank you, the panelists, for, uh, for being here to help answer questions. Uh, and with that, we will conclude our meeting. Thank you and good night.